We've got some hey, I'm Luis. And I'm Luis. And you're listening to the Content control. is Profit podcast. We spent the last four years learning the strategies and techniques from some of the top marketers in the world on how to create content that turns into profit. And today, we're bringing them to you so you can take action immediately and start creating real content momentum. If you'd like to learn more about how to turn your content into profit, go to contentisprofit.com. Oh, yeah. Episode 213. And today we have a master salesman here with us. So if you have been struggling to turn your conversations into conversations, your into conversations, conversions. into conversions. <laughs> oh, baby. This is the episode for you, my friend. Today's guest is the father of the sales evangelist. He's also the host of the Sales Evangelist podcast and soon to be a published author. But most importantly, he is a family man. Can't wait to begin. Please welcome the Jamaican businessman, the sales evangelist himself, Donald Kelly. Woo-hoo! There we <laughs> go. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> yeah, that's a beautiful part about being, being live. You know, Donald, know, like, I got a know, question like, for you. Have you yeah. ever been in a show <laughs> this accidental at the beginning? Huh? <laughs> no, see, it wasn't even accidental. It was just like the way it's supposed to happen. You know, you know, um, we just woke everybody up and got their attention. And that's what we want. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Uh, I, I, this, this side angle right here is, is odd. It's the first time we do the show with the side angle. But I, I think this is, we might be doing this for the first time ever because we're talking to you, but then we're going to talk to the audience over here. So what, what's going to happen? Why are we, why are we, what are we doing? Yeah. <laughs> but Donald, first of all, man, thank you so much for coming here. Uh, thank you so much for dealing with our awkwardness as well. Oh, please. Dude, I, I loved the, the webinar that you did at Calendly. I mean, I said it in the intro. As soon as you were done, I'm like, I'm going to put one of these techniques to the test, right? <laughs> Actually, I put two to the test. One was with you. Some, the other one was with somebody else. And it immediately worked. You immediately answered. And I was like, this is unbelievable. Someone like you that has 1,400 podcast episodes, right? A yeah. very big audience on LinkedIn. And here I am making one of these omnipresence outreach <laughs> and I got the attention, right? And you managed to come here today, man. So thank you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, man. I appreciate it. And I, I, I love when people apply the stuff because it works. And I think that's the biggest thing. That's the biggest like level of like, uh, um, you know, a biggest uh, compliment that you can give to somebody who gives education or provide education. If you go back to like your high school or mm. your middle school, you like your teachers who probably they gave you advice and you took those advice and you apply them that, Makes them, if you go back, at, you know, five years later, like, you know, you had a big impact on my life, Mr. Russell, because you said this once in class and I took that and applied it and this is where I'm at. Those teachers will be like so happy, like this is why I get thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 a year because of that. <laughs> and then in my case, probably get a little paid a little bit more than that. But yeah. it's <laughs> yeah. it's just cool when I'm able to see people apply yeah. to stuff and see results because that's what it's all about is sharing yeah. what's working and, and help them to be successful. I, I have a question. This, this is sure. like a little tangent right here, but you said... Thank you, Mr. Russell, right? You know what you said right now. Is it because we were mentioning Funnel Hacking Live? And you know, (laughs) is it because of that? Because I'm like, dude, if that, if you put that in there. Mr. Russell was, you know, Donald's fifth grade. Uh, Maybe, (laughs) maybe. I'm like, man, (laughs) what a way to build some rapport in here. (laughs) No, but that's all good. I mean, you know, it could be all just like all the connection. I have one of my uh, clients and uh, he, he went to Funnel Hack a lot, Funnel, Funnel, Hacker Live, and he was on stage. He got a, oh, nice. um, he represented one of his uh, the companies that he worked with at one point. That's um, and they made it to two comma club. So Andres Escobar, his company's called Review Biz. So big shout out to them. Yes, let's but he, go. he got that uh, the two comma club. But so when you mentioned that, I was like, oh cool, you probably got a chance to see each other and didn't realize it. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, but Russell, I had a history teacher named Mr. Russell. It was fun being in his class. I wouldn't say he had the deepest impact on my life, but uh, it was. Yeah. Fun. I just thought of him yeah. right there. But, <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. Jonah, and what, what you just said is so, it's so important, right? Like when we really uh, got momentum, when we really sure. starting applying the things that we're learning, right? Especially in this today, days and age, right? That we go online and we go to, we have all these resources and, and literally like if we apply ourselves and we consistently execute, right? We will get results, right? And, and it's so important because for the first like three years, maybe we're in that loop that we were like learning and then learning and then implementing mm-hmm. just a little bit and then learning again. And nothing like really, really worked out for us because of that reason. So I thank you so much for bringing that up. And I really want to ask you, like, why 
why sales? Like, what was your background that you really got into this? You know, for us, for the audience, um, that why is like Calendly calling you, being like, hey, you need to talk about this to our incredible audience, right? I think this. Oh, is- I want to add a, a layer. I want to add a little bit, <laughs> la- a, a layer under that question too. You know, I I read a little bit about your bio. I actually heard a little bit in in some other interviews, right? Yeah. And you come from from Jamaica, right? That's Rude why. Boy. Yeah, awesome. man. Like <laughs> businessman, right? And I was like, "This is so cool, right?" And you say you you saw the hustle and that you wanted to be this businessman, right? Uh, yeah. From when when you were a child. So if you can, you know, kind of like connect that to the question of my brother, I would. I think it would be absolutely amazing. Well, you stole the answer then, because that's it. <laughs> because uh, as a kid, seeing that in Jamaica, seeing my family do. In Jamaica, growing up, like it's not like you know the U.S. where you can just go and say, "Okay, I I, I finished my degree. I'm gonna go put my job on Indeed, my my uh, resume, uh, fill out and and get a job." Like it it doesn't go that way. Like it's yeah. hard. It's, it's still classified as a third world country. So there's still a little bit of challenges that you you have. So the average income, I think, in Jamaica for a year, I think it's like five hundred dollars. Uh, well, for for some some crazy low yeah. number, it's ridiculous. It's, it's ra- uh, really yeah. low. So you 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 find people that are going to figure out ways that they're going to make money um, to make things happen. So individuals will they will hustle, right? They will go out and you know sell things like uh, products or, or whatnot. Um, I think it's five hundred dollars per month. Please forgive me on that. Um, but the the mm-hmm. point though is that it's, it's it's low relative to what we're earning here in the United States. Mm-hmm. So there's not a lot of jobs and exports. One of the biggest export out of Jamaica is its people, where they will go to the UK wow. because the education system is is amazing. So to go to UK, go to North America, to England, I mean to uh, US or to Canada, and to find opportunities there. So now you have folks who are in Jamaica and they're like, well, I can't get that job as like the next tour guide, or I can't get another opportunity. You know, there's not that many stuff i'm gonna create my own tour guide business or i'm gonna go out and and start selling some stuff and that's what i saw i didn't see it as sales i just saw it as like as you know you just become a businessman so as a kid i wanted to get some food i mean some uh not food some toys and uh the i got some food some little candies and i put them in little bags um some cookies put them in little bags and i started selling that and i remember one wow. time I wanted to get free resources, so I went up to the tree. We had trees and a mango tree, and I would pick the mangoes and put them out on the little the area, and I was trying to sell them. And um, and then that, that was like my first uh, ad, my first uh, entry into this online, uh, not online, into this business world of trying to sell something. I didn't make any money. Yeah, but I tried, and I think that was so that went on. So when it come towards sales, when I came to the U.S., that's the same type of thing that I did. I found little jobs and I created mm-hmm. little things in middle school, and so I was a kid that was selling candy in middle school, and then I went to high school, and I was trying to find mo- get money for like holidays and you know back to school and coming from a single parent home. My mom couldn't do all that stuff, so we had to figure out ways to do that. And then yeah. in college, my buddies and several friends and people that I knew close to me said, "You should think about sales." And I didn't know all that experience was leading me to sales. It was just being a businessman. And that is um, how I eventually came to this path. Yeah. Interesting. So, you know, I heard in one of the podcasts that you were featured that kind of the word hustling, right? Like you were hustling there in Jamaica, like trying to make this work. And you said that the, the definition of like hustling has changed in the last decade or so, right? But I'm curious, like, what what do you see right now? Because it seems like when you came here, you were still in that mindset of, I'm going to make it work, right? I'm going to find a path no matter what. And then it seems like sales was was the path, right, that, that led you to where you are right now. So I'm curious, do you still hustle in a way, right? What are your thoughts around that and around people that are starting their own business that are getting into sales, right? I mean, once you start your own business at first, you are the one doing the selling. And that's something that people need to realize faster, right? Like I struggled to came along, uh, <laughs> came across that conclusion. I was like, oh, guess what? Uh, I don't have a business if I don't have clients, right? We got to go out there and, <laughs> and, and sell some. Um, and it, it has been a, a challenge, honestly, right? To, to get into the role of the salesman. So I'm curious, how does this hustle translate into today? Yeah, great. And uh, and there's another question I want to go back to, and I'll make sure I put that as like a caveat to respond 
regarding how the stuff came with Calendly, because I think you're going to like the answer to that. And I don't think you know yes. the answer yet, um, but it ties very closely with what you guys uh, focus on. Um, but the, to, so this, this idea of the hustle, and I know hustle gets this bad a term, bad name nowadays. Um, and I really just want to just like clarify, I'm not trying to say anything that, you know, that everybody who does like a side gig, you could call it whatever somebody doing Uber on the side is a side gig. Um, it's a side hustle, something, something else that you're doing, but I'm not saying that you stay up all night and you don't sleep and that you're, if you do this, it's going to work. Things still, bad things still happen and situations still don't work out. Oftentimes you get lucky. And the way I define luck is that it's opportunity to meet hard work. You put the work in, it's t it's crazy how all of a sudden you start getting luckier um, the more the more work you put in. So I, I feel that you still need to, you need to make, the, you need still need to do your hustling part per se. And early on in my career, when I first started doing this, I did do a lot of hustle, meaning I ran fast. I did a lot of stuff. I I try I try to make it work. I was doing my full time job, and I was getting up early in the morning or staying up, you know, to you know, in the, staying up later in the evening to do some interviews and sacrifice the time of going out and hanging out with friends. And I did a couple podcast interviews and went to bed and got my sleep. And I got up early because I go to early to bed or you know early to rise. So was, when I say I stayed up late, I was probably staying up to like nine, ten o'clock. <laughs> I'm not a late person, but I'll still get up my reasonable time, Absolutely. get my ex my pro adequate sleep and exercise. And I was taking care of myself, but I still had to work harder than just like sitting around and going to happy hour with friends. And I don't drink anyways, but I would focus my effort on doing my business. That was my hobby. So now when it comes towards this idea, like everyone who wants to do a business, everyone who wants to thrive it is going to require you to dedicate more time towards that business. And it's going to require you to sacrifice. And I think that's where that, when I say hustle, that's what it is. I'm willing to sacrifice certain things and hustle on the side to make it happen. When oftentimes you find a lot of people who are comfortable and if they're comfortable doing their day job and don't want to change, that's cool. You don't have to. And it's not something that everybody needs to do. But if you want to make a business thrive, you're going to have to put some sweat equity into it Absolutely. as well to make it happen. Yeah, no, I, I love it. I mean, when you were telling the story mm. of the, the candy, you know, we go back uh, when we were at school and, you know, I'm wearing my Barca jersey because they're playing today. Shut up. Don't, yeah. don't, don't, don't tell me what happened. But we were those kids that will go to uh, this market on the side and they will sell these T-shirts that or the jerseys that looked exactly the, the original versions, right, <laughs> in Venezuela. And the original versions, let's say it was 100 bucks. We'll, we'll buy these for like 10, right? And then we'll go back to school and they'll be like, where did you get that? And then we're like, oh, we can bring it to you for like 25 bucks or whatever, right? So <laughs> that was like, that was the hustle back then. But we were yeah. like, we were solving their problem, right? Which yeah. the, which was like, how, how do I find that t-shirt cheaper than the original version? But it looks exactly the same and it feels exactly yeah. the same. We're like, you, you were getting a lot of trouble here doing that. Yeah, <laughs> don't do that. Don't do that. Yeah, yeah don't, don't go ahead and do that. But like, it reminded me like on that mindset, we're like, okay, we are actually solving this problem. And then sometimes when people go into into sales mode, right? They completely detach the meaning of service, being of service to that one person and solving their problem. And they go into like this weird mental state where like, I need to push push this thing to like whoever comes in front of me, right? And you were helping a fitness studio right now where that that's one of the conversations that we're, that we're having with the people at the front where they welcome the people, right? These are people that are interested in, in their health and their stuff. And they're coming into the studio with a problem, right? Whatever that is, like, let me lose some weight. Let me, I want to get, you know, a, a little bit fitter because I have an event. I want to keep up with my kids. You know, I want to stop rolling down the street. Like that's my case. <laughs> and, and it's like, okay, perfect. So the people at the front are terrified because that is, and I'm quotation here, that starts the sales process. And we're like, okay, well, we're, we're serving them, right? They're coming with a problem. We have a solution that a really good solution that can help them. So do you ever encounter something like that where you're like, okay, sales mode, no sales mode. What did it come natural to you? And how do you, how do you navigate that with, with your client, with the people that you help? Yeah, I think so many people have a bad view of sales. Like they see it as the four letter word that is just like, that's so awful. And in actuality, because the reason is the way they perceive sale, like the sales has been uh, like been uh, victimized over the years and been abused sure. in the way that, you know, uh, unsavory characters have done it and i think there's a difference between selling and also being a con artist and there are people i'm not sure if you remember the movie like boiler room back in the days i remember i was in school and i watched boiler room and i and, and i don't think they should have showed us that in high school but they did and <laughs> they were um and they were the things that they were doing to get these deals i'm like man that is so that's so like that's so 
bad and awesome. Like they're able to convince that person and to do all these different tricks and strategies. And they were getting these people like making money off these people, but they were robbing people. It was unethical. They got in trouble in the end. Yeah. And when you look at many of the biggest sales movies that are out there, that's what it is. Like, you know, yeah. all, you know, Alec Baldwin and, you know, in Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross and, you know, the Wolf of Wall Street. It's like these people who are tricking and convincing people, but the great salespeople. If you make a movie about a great sales pre person, nobody would watch it because we're boring. <laughs> it's like this person really brought value to this person and they, the client won and made tons of money and they also made money from it. This is boring. Where's the drama? Who's going to jail? So people yeah. have this stigma like, that's what sales is. Sales is not convincing people to do something. That's the issue. And I know that sounds blasphemy to some people out there. Sales is convinced, is helping people convince themselves. Jeffrey Ginnimer says, and I think he gets it from some of the greats like Zig Ziglar, said people love to buy, but they hate to be sold. Yes. Like people, I, I, I'd love to go and spend money. I'll go spend my, you know, what, $1,000 on an iPhone. But if I have somebody in the store coming up to me or the mall and say, hey, buy this nice iPhone. It's going to be beneficial for you, blah, blah, blah. I don't want you to sell me. And if somebody told me, you, you, you know, I got sold a car, I got sold a phone, I got sold the service, they're more than likely going to return that. But if somebody gets that ownership and said, I bought a car, I mm -hmm. bought a phone, I bought this new house. They have ownership. They were a part of that process. And the seller helped them to make that decision. And that's what you want to do. So when it comes towards that, that gym or that studio or that fitness uh, place where you're talking about, it's not so much as like, I'm, I, I hate the sales process now because I'm going to have to try to convince them. No, we want to solve problems. There's a moral obligation. If you have a business, yes. you have yes. a moral obligation. My moral obligation is that I remember when I was eating Wendy's dollar menu items or they're on the call dollar menu but the value menu they had these like wendy's wraps and you know that two wraps you can get and there's yeah. a dollar each and i would get a cup of water and that's what i was eating for lunch because i was working a sales job and i was supposed to be successful and i wasn't being successful in the b2b sales and this sucked because this was a job that i needed to succeed at and i remember when i was my, my mom and i i made the first generation of family member the first person in my family to go to college here in the united states she sacrificed all this stuff and here i am begging her who's broke and doesn't have money can she help me pay rent? And I felt so awful. I'm like, this shouldn't be if I'm in sales. And I was able to get the proper learning and training and I started to become successful. And I realized there was a formula. There was a process if you could follow. So then now my moral obligation is to help that person who's watching this video right now. And they're out there and they're trying to sell. They're trying to succeed and they don't know how to do it. I have a moral obligation to tell that person there's a better way. And that's why yes. we have the sales evangelist. I'm evangelizing that there's effective ways of selling and I can show you what that is. And it's that's what gu gu guides me and drives me. So I'm not convincing people. I'm helping them to convince themselves that my services can help them. And when it comes towards that weight loss, I want those people to get out of the, if I was in that situation or gym, I want somebody to have that time with their kid. I want somebody not to just fall asleep on the couch at seven o'clock because they're so tired and out of shape. I want them to be able to, to give the kids a bath and to spend time with them and, and enjoy and to read with them and to and, and give those kids that you know two and a half hours after work. That's what yeah. we're trying to help them. And if I can help them to do that and get that back, it's not selling. I'm helping them to get something better in their life. So. Come on, y'all got me excited. Let's go. I, I, lo I love the en the energy went from like a 10 to a hundred, dude. I was like, hey, yeah. dude, no, I absolutely love it. And I'm just saying this is on a scale from one to ten. So <laughs> your, your energy was already pretty good. And I'm like, wow. Um, you got me all pumped up over here. And you mentioned two things that I, I wrote down here. I, I thought they were extremely helpful, right? And I think it, if that is the only takeaway that people get from today's podcast. I think is going to change their sales journey. First, sales is not convincing people. Sales is help people convince themselves. I think that is so deep right there. I mean, mm. there's obviously a process that comes with helping others convince themselves, right? About, hey, yes, I do need help in this. Like, I guess that art of realization, right? Mm. It's not about us just talking and talking and telling them what to buy, right? But it's about helping them discover what is the solution that they need to the problems? And we can go a little bit deeper. Oh, please, I, please. I can, no, no, I can you see that you, you're, you're, you're like, oh, yeah. you're biting my lip. I'm like, <laughs> give it to me. <laughs> no, he, the way it comes down, though, it's like the there was, uh, if you anyone knows Gong, gong.io, uh, they have an amazing software. It listens to this, the conversation, like the Zoom meetings and, you know, the go, -to me uh, the go to meeting with the sales reps. And one of the things they discovered is something that sales has had as like this folklore or this, this truth 
for years, but now it's been finally validated. So Gong, they listen to all of these calls and they prove that the top performing sellers on conversation speaks 30 to 40 percent of the time and let the client speak 60 to 70 percent of the time. It's like, whoa, mm -hmm. how is this happening? I'm a salesperson. I should have the gift of gab. I should talk a lot. And it doesn't come off that that doesn't make you a great seller. And that's one of the issues when you see with these movies again, they're convincing people. And that means you're yep. if you're trying to convince somebody so much. You're, that means you're more than likely not telling the truth. But when you ask deep, thoughtful questions. I can tell you, buy this water. It's going to be healthy. It's going to be good for you. And I can tell you all the features, and the bottle is great, and it's recyclable, and it's BPA-proof, blah, blah, blah. But if I can say, hey, Luis, if there's a way that I can give you a product that's going to help you to perform better when you're doing podcasts, give you more energy throughout the day, and help you to live a longer life, would you be open to hearing more about that? Heck yeah, let's uh, do it. Yeah. Okay. Is, it, is it gonna help us not be as awkward at the beginning of the podcast? <laughs> there you go. So you're gonna you're gonna start you're starting to ask questions. And I'll say, yep. interesting. Tell me more. Why do you what, tell me what does awkward mean? How is it how are you going in that situation? Well, this is what we have, you know, to begin of a conversation. We're yep. tired and we don't have enough energy. So whatever, I'm you know, I'm making stuff up. But the point yeah, is yeah. I'm asking you thoughtful questions, going deeper into your problems, mm. and then you're naturally becomes you be, naturally come recognize. And in, in self-diagnose and to problem solve that this solution may be a tool that can help you with that problem. Yeah. And I'm the guide because I've done that, that before and helped other people. So it's more about asking effective questions. And the less, and the less you talk and let the prospect talks more, they convince themselves. Mm, I love this. So I, I want to transition a little bit to sure. the content side of things, right? And, and selling maybe through content. But before that... You told me that you were going to, you know, share with us the story about Calendly. And now I'm like, oh, what is it? What happened See, there? I got you there. I hooked you. A good copy. You did, right? yeah. <laughs> so what if I told you, um, and this is some, a process that I'm learning, right? Um, brands have, this was all by accident. Uh, so brands have, uh, like, they, everyone's trying to get market share. Everyone's trying to do their thing. So. What I start to look is learn to zig when everyone else is zagging. Mm -hmm. Calendly, they were trying to come into the sales arena more so. They're trying to define audiences. And so a couple of years ago, they started having features that really helped. And I'm like, is Calendly built for sales? I, I mean, it's like, no, everybody uses Calendly. But yeah. I am a salesperson, so I saw it from the sales eye. So I wrote a blog yeah. post, Calendly for sales. You know, mm -hmm. reasons why I like Calendly for sales. 2019 on LinkedIn. Go look it up. So I'm giving you guys all my secret now. I'm That's not the greatest writer in the world, but I felt I wanted to write this piece. I wrote this piece Calendly a year and a half later now because, again, mm -hmm. they're trying to now come into the enterprise space. I was zigging when everyone was zagging. I, I betted on this, and I didn't purposely bet on it. I just wrote a piece. But Calendly now recognized that sales is really good for their tools and it can help salespeople. So they started focusing on enterprise deals. So they started reaching out to people who are writing content and they're like, well, who wrote this piece? Go look for Calendly for sales and all the articles are on Calendly. And the last one on the first page is mine. It's a LinkedIn post. Yeah. So now a uh, LinkedIn Pulse article. So now all of a sudden they're like, who is this guy? I want to check him out. So Calendly reach out and they're like, hey, can we interview you? on why you like Calendly so much. And I was like, yeah, because they saw that I'm in the sales arena. They're like, this guy feels like fits our bill. So yeah. then they did an interview with me in a blog post and they're like, crap, that was good. Um, would you be open to doing a webinar? And we did a webinar. And because I was on a webinar, I was access to, you know, you know, a hundred, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, like 10,000 people that Ooh. was able to register for that. And I was able to get access to that. And it was because of content. So go back to this idea of, again, of writing effective content that tailored towards your prospects and towards pieces. And that content, some of you are writing content out there. They're like, well, Luis, you know, I wrote this piece and nobody did anything with it. You wrote that like two weeks ago. Like, give it time. Use the right keywords. Use the right things and take advantage of everything that you're sharing on this podcast. And over time, it took a year a year and a half, 2019 to 2020 before uh, 2021, before Calendly recognized that I even knew that piece was there, but now yeah. it's recognized and it built the weight and it, the connection. So now I'm here in front of your audience and I'm here with you all watching this because of the simple fact that I took action. I wrote something 
and that content piece. And Luis got a chance to meet me and brought me here in front of this audience. And some of you are going to reach out to me and that relationship is going to still grow because I wrote a piece yeah. two and a half years ago or two years ago. Yeah, Come on, man. Absolutely. Ah, you, got, you got the, the host clap. <laughs> the host <laughs> clap. Here we go. Understanding ovation. Understanding too. ovation. So uh, the, like, this, is, this is very exciting, right? Because you know we, we came from a conference that, and one of the main things that people were asking us, right, is about this thing and why we publish and why we do this. And people come into the show and our community, same thing. And for us, you know, the show has been alive since March last year, right? And uh, congratulations! Thank you, thank yeah. you, appreciate it. And and I and I love this because it's those seeds, and we, you know, we've been trying to talk about this concept of you know publishing real estate or content real estate or podcasting real estate, right? And it's all these things that we put out there into the world, which are our thoughts, right? In different way, shape, or form. For us, is is this show, and there's some ideas coming as well to experiment. But at the end of the day. Those ideas are gonna are gonna track back. People are gonna find us, right? And we go back and we look at the data, and there's episodes that we published, you know, five, six months ago, nine months ago, even a year ago, right? That are the most popular episodes because people continue to find those. So I want to encourage everybody: if your story was not the proof that you should start publishing now, right, to start planting those seeds and and grab that real estate, make sure that that you do, right? Figure yes. out a way to do it. <laughs> so, and you know, one of the things you said, what I always tell people, it's a land grab. There's a land grab land going grab. on. And also right now on, I don't know if I want to give out my secrets. Uh, should I tell them? Uh, uh, maybe we'll you, talk right behind camera. <laughs> if, you do, if you do B2B sales, you need to be on LinkedIn. If yeah. you do, if you sell anything to business, and here's the reason why. You ever remember that you ever go to dance, Luis? Like, you know, you guys would go to dance back in the days and, and middle school, and you got that, you know, it seemed like that one idiot out there just dance with everybody and just going <laughs> around, and you got everybody on the side being cool with their boys and the girls, girls just like chilling and talking, you know, yeah. just bobbing. <laughs> but everybody else is dancing. That's what happens on LinkedIn. Yeah. LinkedIn has 700 and north of 750 million users. About half of those people are active on LinkedIn. Wow. So we, let's say like, you know, what, what's that three? Let's just call it 350 just to be simple. 350 million. But off those 350 million, guess how many people actively post on LinkedIn per week? Guess how many uh, people actually post? Like 5% of those. No, I, oh, per month, actually, I think the number is. But it's, the point is, it's 3 million. So wow. the 350, only 3 million. So off that, those all those people are getting the, I think LinkedIn has 9 billion impressions per month or per week. So those 3 million people who are posting regularly, they're getting that 9 billion impression. That's Woo! all going to them. So it oh. can, you can do, you can post content, micro blogs on LinkedIn. The, the point though, is that when you take advantage of like LinkedIn and you're sharing content now, if you're those 3 million people, you share content on LinkedIn, you share content on any platform because those things become like, they're there forever. They're yes. there for forever. And no matter how many you try to delete them, I mean, Google has the hold, right? So you, you get, those things are going to still be there and it's going to still be recognized. People go back and find my first ever video and I'm just like, holy moly, that was awful. But it's <laughs> there. And people yeah. find some of the podcasts like you're saying from, from months ago and years ago. And it's like, that's there. Like that piece is still helping them. And it's yes. like, yeah, the content is still good. So you just need to start. The best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The second best time is today. Yeah. And for each and every one of us, we just need to produce content um your audience I you're doing it. yourself a this your audience a disservice if you're not giving them content yeah there there's cool. so 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 many benefits and you know thank you so much for for sharing you know all, all these things and you that mentioned you know my, data my, yeah good. <laughs> and you said like hey my first video was up there right but at the and people are so scared of people go finding those those old videos, but guess what? You will become better over time. And then they're going to notice the difference. We're like, wow, how much have they grown? How much has he grown? And then mm -hmm. the, the, if, if the value is there, they're going to appreciate it. The, the you know quality of the message or quality of the production 100% of the time. Yep. And uh, the quality of production will come because the resources will come. You're going to be able to serve. You're going to be able to help. You're going to be able to solve those problems to your audience. And I love it. So fancy homework for us. We got to start going to LinkedIn. Uh, maybe 45 Live is LinkedIn maybe special. We'll do a 45 season five. Live on, yeah. on LinkedIn. No, I'm just going to say that. Dude, I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm loving this, you know, and I mean, um, you have 1400 episodes of your podcast, right? The, that is absolutely amazing, right? Unless there was like a typo on the form that we sent and I'm totally throwing this, this number out there, <laughs> right? But I mean, that's a lot of episodes. And I'm curious, right? What has been the role of that consistency for you, right? Not just on LinkedIn, but creating your own platform where you can maybe have conversations with influential people in the marketplace, or you have a platform for yourself to, you know, talk about these pains and problems that your prospects are having and you're helping them 
solve the, the problems? What have been that, that effect that you've seen around your business? Great question. Um, as of Monday, 1493. Um, let me just check while we're here. So let's go. Let's, go. Oh, let's go. So we started doing this. I started in 2013. So the, go back to like this idea of creating your own. Let's just put this in perspective. I was doing a software sales job and my um, my buddy, um, have you guys ever heard of podcast movement? But yeah, 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 the 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 event, correct? Podcast. So my friend and I, we Jared Easley, he was one of co, he's one of the co-founders, and he was a, he and I worked together. I was a sales rep, he was account engineer, um, account ma uh, engineer, and did the demos, and we would go around walking around a pond, and we were coming up with these business ideas, and then he was like, you know what? Um, he went to New Media Expo, and he's like, dude, podcasting is where it's at. This is twenty like twenty eleven, um, twenty twelve, and he's like, podcasting is where it's at. Um this business ideas, we don't have enough money and the capability of doing it. I'm gonna jump into podcasting. I'm like, Oh, dang it, man, he's gonna leave me out here. And then he went into podcasting. And then he was like, bro, you need to get into podcasting. So I started going to podcasting, he and Dan, Frank, and a couple others started to get together and started to say like, um, they created there wasn't a conference there for podcasters and they create podcast movement. Um, so I, I had had a fortune opportunity for a few years there to MC and be a part of that community and part of that world. Um, and, and grateful for the things that I've gotten opportunity to learn from and with podcast movement. So this idea though, was like, can there be money that can get from this? And I remember one, one of my other friends, I was sitting on his front porch and I was talking to him. I was like, man, I'm thinking about doing this podcasting thing full time. I'm just, I've been doing it for a number. I started in 2013 and then it's like, you know, been going for a little bit and then I'm trying to do my own business sales consulting firm from it. And he was like, you know, what do you need to do? I was like, man, I just need to make a thousand dollars a month. If I can make a thousand dollars a month, that can pay off my port of the rent and my wife will be happy and, you know, she'll be, it'll be good to go. So a thousand dollars a month. And he was like, all right, well, keep working towards that, man. And, um, so this podcast thing just really, and I interviewed Seth Godin was my first, wow. um, podcast I listened to. And then I just interviewed him last week. Um, yes. So, you know, eight years later. So it was really cool. Incredible. But in that whole point, though, what I'm getting at, remember, De uh, Jose was my first client. He listened to the podcast. He saw it. He's like, can you help me out? So I started paying for, he started paying for something. Destiny, I didn't know her at all. She discovered my podcast. She was local of Fort Lauderdale. She started listening to it. And then people started to pay, uh, purchase. And I was like, man, there's something here. I could coach these people. There really is something. So the podcast became an avenue for, for me to be able to share wisdom and also to be able to start yeah. building tribe. And I created a Facebook group. So now we have uh, salespeople that come a part of our, it's called the sales evangelizers. And uh, they yeah. come across this group and we started building this community. And then next thing you know, in 2015, we got sponsored by Prezi. And then we were like, man, this is super cool. And then it came to the point where it's like, can we jump ship? And I was making more than that thousand dollars and we were consistent with it. So it made sense for me to leave my full-time gig. But the community that came from the podcast and the yeah. opportunity and the content, it was just like, I own that. That was mine per se. Uh, my area rather than, you know, LinkedIn, uh, obviously like pod, uh, Apple and all these folks, they have, still have the podcast community. And uh, fortunately, my group is on LinkedIn, on Facebook. But again, I have my website and I have my email list. And all of that came from just this idea of doing a podcast and the client's from yeah. doing that. So it's like, it is power in creating your own avenue. Now I'm not telling everyone they need to go create a podcast and uh, I would love for you to do so because TSC studios will make money. We produce podcasts for major brands and, nice. and that's my second company now that came from that. But um, the, the point though, is that not everyone needs to do a podcast, but if your audience need that message, maybe they need live stream. Maybe they need like you to write blog posts for them. Maybe they need like, you know, you to go live on Instagram and create little reels. If that's for your audience, create the content that they need, give yeah. them what they need. And you just need to start. And if you don't do it, somebody else is going to do it. And why not you? You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Answers. Oh yeah. No, 100%. I mean, if this is not inspiration for those <laughs> trying to figure out how to do content, please, like, uh, you can leave the podcast <laughs> right now. Uh, you know, I'm not, well, leave and come back. Cause you know, you, you can <laughs> come back. We, we need, we need you. Uh, yeah. we, lo we love you. Just love. leave for a second, reflect on that. And, and then, then come, come back. back. Yeah. <laughs> we, we still love you. Um, and I love it. Right. And you mentioned something at the end. It's like, Hey, figure out what's easy for you to produce that your audience needs as well, right? A podcast yeah. for us, it was a vehicle that helped us create these conversations and then the business really evolved around it, very similar to, to you. But at the same time, it, it would have been impossible if it's something that we, never, we, that we don't enjoy 
actually producing it. So at first we got to remove that friction and then like, where is my audience? Where is the people that I help? Mm -hmm. And then try to figure out the, and deliver that content in a, in a way that they can consume it. They're used to, and then evolve from there. Like you did with your LinkedIn posts, like the, the current yeah. publishing that you do and everything that you do around your business. So thank you. I, th I think that's very useful for, for the people that are trying to start in their yeah. publishing journey. I, can I share one more thing with starting? Ooh, sure. Absolutely. December 2013 is when the first podcast went live. My wife and I were on the way to go watch the movie, The Hunger Games at the theater. And because uh, I'd finished reading the books and we were going out to watch that. And then Apple sent the approval. Your podcast has been approved. And we're like, oh, man, this is crazy. And you're getting like, you know, 30 people downloading it and or 30 downloads. I'm like, this is nuts. This is awesome. Yeah. And um, checking it all, all the time. And then um, mm. what happened, though, I almost didn't do it, even though my buddy Jared told me to do it since 2012, right? In April of 2013, I launched my website and it was a WordPress site and it was like awful. And that's where I, I was like thinking, I want to do videos. I think that'd be easier than trying to learn the podcasting thing. It's too complicated. I could just do a quick video, or play with it. I did video in high school and stuff. Yeah. And maybe I could just edit a video. And that was my first video. And I did one or two of them. And then I stopped. And nothing from April all the way to December because I was afraid. I was worried and I was scared that what if it doesn't go? What if people don't like it? What if people don't like what I'm doing? What if people don't find benefit from it? What if it sucks? Um, fast forward now to Donald in 2022. I'm so grateful. I've traveled halfway around the world because of that podcast that I was able to finally launch in 2013, in the December of 2013. Um, and I've been able to have clients all across the globe. Literally, I can say that um, now. And it's really, really neat. And it's just so powerful through the medium of podcasts. And it's just getting it. started. Yes. Just do it. Wow. I, yeah. I love this. You know, th this is the way I perceive content. It's oppor yeah. opportunities, right? Content is opportunities, and the more consistent you're with it, the more consistently you're going to be in front of opportunities. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think that's what happened to you right there in that story, right? You stopped, you didn't do it, and then you're like, you know, let me just be consistent with it. And the, the cool thing is that it's actually like an exponential opportunity maker because the more time you stay in the game, those results just start going right. I was like, "What? Oh yeah, go ahead." You know what I, and, and what I call that? There's a term that I and I was referring to my friends. I call it like your almost like your digital wealth, so mm -hmm. to speak. I'm not talking about cryptocurrency or anything like that. It's like I've and it's some people might say it's unfair. Or Donald, you're speaking. You got lucky because you've been doing this for a long time. Yes, I got lucky because I've been doing it for a long time. Exactly, I've been doing it for a long time. So therefore, of course, I should be getting lucky. So then like the people like Calendly, like you might say, well, you got that because you got mentioned in Forbes. Well, did you know what it took for me to get mentioned in Forbes? It was took like four years of producing content. And somebody said, well, let me mention this guy's one of the top podcasts. Now, yeah. Donald, you get mentioned on all of these lists. So it's a bias. So as soon as somebody puts together a list of best sales podcasts, I am almost, I'm, I'm about 80% certain that I'm going to get mentioned on that list because they're going to go search best sales podcast. And of all those lists, I'm probably on 60% of those lists already. So then wow. therefore, I have an unfair advantage against you because I started a long time ago. And you yeah. could do the same thing as well. But if you don't, yeah. if you keep whining and yeah. say, well, Donald, this is unfair. My digital wealth has been increasing significantly because I've been compounding over and over. And I'm not going to stop. And it's unfair against you, yes. But you can start if you don't have to compete against me. You just need to start in your avenue. If you want to talk about like, you know, NFTs, not a lot of people are creating amazing things on that. That's just recent. Go create an NFT avenue and go do that. And then yeah. you can grow your digital wealth over the next four or five years. But you're yeah. going to start being that expert. And this is why companies reach out to me in large organizations like Canley that I'm able to work with because we shared content. They see my my digital wealth, so to speak. And it compounds over and over and over yeah. and over and over and over and over. In 10 years when we're doing this podcast, I don't know where that's going to be at that point. But I'm super yeah. excited for that. So, uh, th this is, we were actually talking the other day about a similar concept called we were calling it digital footprint right it's like yeah. hey what is that content that you need to create that is gonna leave a footprint like if it was on on a sidewalk right and a yeah. recently paved sidewalk that you put that footprint in there and once it dries up stays there right and people can find it and i think podcasting is one of those platforms where people can type you know sales the sales evangelist is gonna pop up right and since you have that library of digital wealth you're going to have now the status, I, the, the trust of people, multiple reviews, and people are going to say like, okay, this is a good one, right? But then yeah. there's the other side. It's kind of like the quicksand 
footprint that you can post <laughs> something, but then in 24 hours it's gone, right? Which is yeah. the other social medias. And I think there's a balance on what type of content you can use. Like I'm not saying that the quicksand footprint doesn't work, right? But how maybe can we use that to drive traffic to the sidewalk footprint? But I, I if I'm being honest, I, I like your term yeah. way better, the digital well. <laughs> no, yeah. as, as, as we, we might have to license that one from you. Yeah. You know, but it, it, it makes it like you look at sometimes you see like people who are, you know, the ultra rich and you're like, you know, they're ultra rich because they've been they got old money. Like I'm in South Florida and we are close to Palm Beach Island. And you got a lot of these old money like from, you know, years ago, like Henry Ford's people. I mean, those kids never have to work in any day. Maybe 10 generations don't have to work because money just keep compounding over and over. Somebody mm-hmm. started something. We could go back. There's some, you know, other, you know, probably history behind that and <laughs> how they got that money is a different story. But the point is it compounded. And that's what I've been trying to do. So it's like, yeah, you can probably, if you want to compare it to that sense, I may be like a Henry Ford in my avenue. If your sales podcast is starting to try to start tomorrow, it may be a little bit challenging for you, but I, I've built that compounded. I've built that wealth. I've earned that wealth. I've sacrificed. Yeah. I've done that yeah. stuff. And it's not fair for me to just now say that, you know, I'm going to give this all to you and make it happen for you. You need to sacrifice. I'm giving you the strategy, but you need to put your work in. And it doesn't make sense for me to just, and it's not fair. It's not like we can take our audience and say, I'm going to take all my audience and I'll give it to Luis. Luis is like, I want to learn from Donald. So I'm going to tap into Donald and his audience and i'm going to bring work and bring value to his audience and they're going to want to learn from me as well and i might get associated with them and that's what it is so you can do stuff like that but you can't just sit around and just say you know no one i i i i want to think of a blog and it it didn't come to existence and i didn't get 10 million followers right away like you take your it takes time you can't just get it right overnight it takes time and in this world anyone can make it happen though and because if i did it i'm a poor crazy i'm a poor little energetic kid from jamaica <laughs> spanish down jamaica and if i were able to do this over time i mean what can you absolutely. do with like all your talents and skills come on absolutely, absolutely. i mean let's go with the stats that you shared before just keep in mind it's only like one percent of the active users that are actually publishing only one percent so guys there's a lot of opportunity out there start you know building the, your digital wealth if you have been building it, good job. Keep going stronger <laughs> than ever. Yeah. You know, stay consistent. And it, it just reminds me of that image that is like the guy digging for uh, for diamonds. Yeah, and two rows, and it's like one is turning back, and he was just one step closer to finding the diamonds, and the other one is just digging there with conviction. Yeah, Donald. As as we wrap up uh, with sure. the last couple of questions, right? What what's an action point that people can do today to to get that momentum? Right, people that are thinking about publishing, maybe they just started, but they're they're not grabbing enough traction. Like, what can they do to to help their business? The biggest thing that I would say that you can do to help grow your business and to 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 sh- to to start publishing and it, to get it uh, increased is to connect with other people doing the similar thing. So, like, say for instance, like we're complementary, and one of the best ways, and I automatically, I'm just being transparent. One of the other the reasons too, I decide if I'm gonna find people that do want to listen to podcasts, I'm gonna go on other people that have podcasts. So our team, we have a goal to get me on four podcasts per month at least so you know one a week um to somebody else because that's an audience that i can go in front of and that's going to more than likely come back and grow our audience in the long run from that so you need to find people who are who you can do uh who you can help and then they can help you as a natural byproduct of it but if you're just sitting back and you're rolling in your silo by yourself it's not going to work you need to make sure you can get with other people and the other thing that i would say too is find a mastermind um that was one of the best things that helped me and a mastermind really is just like a group of people that have the similar thing maybe at your level or higher that are in a similar uh, space and you can have accountability my mastermind we meet every we have a sales mastermind that's paid so people pay us to be a part of that but then we also have a mastermind with me and entrepreneurs who are colleagues of mine friends and we meet every tuesday morning at eight o'clock it depends on time zone so eight o'clock <laughs> Eastern time. and we 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 challenge each other we yeah. go with um, difficulties and we learn from each other i'm not the smartest one in a mastermind the day that i become the smartest one that's the day i decide that's the day i have to leave that mastermind because you need to always not be the smartest person in a group you need to learn from other people so you yeah. can find a couple other folks online that are doing similar things if you're writing about nft or you're creating content find a couple of the people that are trying to you know build their side hustle on nft and then get together and every week talk about what's the latest yeah things what are some of the challenges you're facing how can you help push each other what are some of the goals you're trying to achieve 
So doing that idea coupled with the concept of going with other people who have audiences helps you. Now, I'm not trying to get on to yet on like, say, like a Will Smith uh, blog or his, you know, whatever content that he produces. I may not be able to get to that level yet. I can't give that much value to Will Smith per se, his audience yet. Maybe I could. But <laughs> the point is I could find other people that are maybe right at, around my level that I can connect with and we can continue to grow with each other. Yeah, and and, yeah. I, and I think that's where we need to, sometimes we, we just sit back in our silos and want to do this by ourselves. We can't succeed on our own. We, we need, if you want to get exponential growth, it requires you to connect with other people. Yeah, absolutely. Thank I mean, you. we, we, uh, yeah, thank you for sharing. We, yeah. we heard, uh, John Lee Dumas, right? Like a couple of days ago. Um, the good old John. I love John. John's a yeah, good friend of mine. So, and he, and he's like, man, I mean, uh, what's it? 20 podcasts, 40 podcasts a month, like as a guest. Right. And it's mm -hmm. like, and he's been doing that consistently for years and years and years. And that's why he has a massive audience of millions of, of, of downloads every single month. Right. And you know, you are executing on that, on that path. And he's like, how do, mm -hmm. how do we build the systems? How do, can we stay consistent? How how, do, how can we do this? So shameless plug, if you have those questions first in sales, go to Donald right here. Ooh. Make sure that scroll down, click the links that we're going to leave right below. And if you have any questions on the content on the system, how can we stay consistent? What can we create? Where can we go? How can we like explode? Be uh, omnipresent. Let us know. Slide into the ZM as this. Donald, uh, last question. Last question of the show. Sure. Beautiful. We love it. It's where will you be if you did not publish? If I did not publish... I would be a cog in the corporate wheel and I probably would be hopping from sales jobs because the company that I was working for, they eventually got sold and um, some people lost their job and I probably would have been hunting around and finding other jobs and going different places rather than being able to say on Fridays, half day, I want to go home and I can end my day and go home with my wife and kid and go on vacation because I have a business now and a team. Um, we have 14 people on our team and we have an organization that grew and I'm grateful that I published. But if not, I'll be a cog in a wheel and annoyed by my boss, maybe. But I'm in a thing that I love and I enjoy it. And I will keep hitting publish until the day it becomes boring and it hasn't gotten that point yet. So. Yes, let's Love go. Yeah. Thank I'm you back. so much. Yeah, hopefully that never comes, but you know, if it becomes boring, just let us know. We'll do like a <laughs> show, like with the bros and the Jamaican business. Yeah, man. Hey, <laughs> let's go. That's awesome. Um, we're we're going to have to have you back for round two one of these days. Keep talking about sales, obviously. So but good. then Thank you. share about all those stories because I heard something interesting that you don't like seafood, but I'm going to leave it right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is true. I'm going to leave it right there. But uh, yeah, but yeah that, I'm sure you got so many good stories. You know, where, where can people find you? Where can, con where can people connect with you? What's the best way? So here's the thing. So I'm going to tell you too, I'm, I've been able to learn from smart people like you guys. Um, make sure you're, you're, uh, you're, you're everywhere so people can find you. So you can find me, Donald C. Kelly, on Twitter, on Instagram, on LinkedIn, anywhere, Donald C. Kelly. Um, and I, what I would like for you to do is if you reach out to me on Instagram or on LinkedIn, just say, you know, Donald C. Kelly and say, hey, I connected with you after listening to the content as Profit Podcast. And I would greatly appreciate that. And I will talk to you. I'll literally respond to you. Um, so if you want to get really good connection with me right away, shh, go to Instagram. And <laughs> so, I know, I know. Come on, guys. It, it, it works. I'm, I'm, I'm going to share. I mean, I kind of shared at the beginning, but this is the what we call the golden boulder. Instead of golden nuggets, golden boulder that you share with us during that the webinar that I'm not sure if everybody grasped the power of that, but it's the omnipresence outreach. So yes, like he said, Instagram is going to be helpful to stay in touch with them. But in case that gets digged into the bottom of the inbox, make sure you're reaching out in other channels as well. You never know where, where you're going <laughs> to catch his attention. Yeah. Donna, anything else you want to add before we head out? Yeah, I just want to tell people if they're listening to this, this has and it's been beneficial to you. This podcast um, content is profit. I ask you to do something. Um, the brothers probably won't necessarily they probably do it, but sometimes it takes an outsider to remind you. This is gold. This is amazing. And I would just ask for you guys to share it. And if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, leave them a review or on Stitcher or Spotify tune in. It goes such a long way when they're able to read the reviews and see that people out there care for it. And if you share this with your friend or family, somebody else, 
That's great. So if you're watching the live right now, please just go ahead and share it. Tell somebody else about it. Tag them in the comments. And I know they'll appreciate that because I sure appreciate it when that happens to me. So this is a great stuff. And I don't say this on all the podcasts that I go on, but this podcast is amazing. Um, the content here is great. So you guys need to make sure you're helping them get the word out. So thank Thanks, you. Guys. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, man. I'm not going to lie. I'm, I'm super thankful and surprised after all those technical issues. I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> thank you, Donald. You're absolutely amazing. Uh, no. <laughs> all right, guys. With that said, thank you so much for tuning into the Contest Profit Podcast. Go ahead and follow the show. Hit smash that subscribe button and follow us on social media at Base Rosco. That is right. And if Donald here today help you move one step closer to your goal, please don't forget to share this episode and and leave a five-star review. See ya. Bye, guys.